Ron Paul is not going to be your next president. So why are millions of young people hanging on every word from the 76-year-old Texas congressman? I think the federal war on drugs is a total failure. I think the uh, Patriot Act is unpatriotic because it undermines our liberty. I don't remember voting on, on a, a declared declaration of war. And why is the GOP so afraid of him? Allow the people to make their decisions and not get the government involved. Tonight, Ron Paul, one-on-one, -on -one, no holds barred. I'm willing to challenge any of these gentlemen up here to a 25-mile bike ride any time of the day in the heat of Texas. How he's already changing the face of the Republican Party. If you have an irate, tireless minority, you do very well in the caucus state. Ron Paul answers my questions and your questions from Twitter tonight. Piers Morgan interview starts now. Tonight, the Piers Morgan interview comes to you from Las Vegas on the eve of the Nevada caucuses. I'm at Coy at Planet Hollywood to talk to candidate Ron Paul. He's running a distant fourth here in Nevada, but his influence on young people is far greater than that. His supporters are making him a force to be reckoned with in the Republican Party. And tonight, his formula for keeping America great. That, and a little later, I'll have a supersized only in America. But right now, Ron Paul. Dr. Paul, welcome. Thank you. Nice now, to be with this you. will sound like shameless name dropping, but the last time I dined in this restaurant, was with Sylvester Stallone. And the parallel to me is clear. You are the Rocky Balboa <laughs> of this campaign. How do you feel about that analogy? I, I have no idea how to respond <laughs> to that. I, I hope that's very positive. It sounds like it could be positive. Well, I guess the problem is every, Americans love an underdog. And you remain an underdog despite this continual, extraordinary support, particularly with the young people. But people still perceive you as an underdog. Do you believe, like Rocky Balboa, that you could surprise everybody and actually win this race? Do you genuinely believe you could become the nominee? Yeah, obviously so. And, uh, and I think the record of this campaign, uh, you know, the Republican campaign these last almost 12 months now, shows you that a lot of the candidates are coming and going. You know, mm -hmm. they come in, they peek out, and all of a sudden they're gone. And uh, we did have nine. We're, we're down to four right now. The one thing characteristic of our campaign is its steady growth. And uh, I saw a little clip the other day on the internet that says, once you become a Ron Paul supporter, you remain a Ron Paul supporter. <laughs> well, that's true. And also, once you have a Ron Paul principle, your supporters say, you stick to that principle. And that is certainly a, a great plus, I think. When you look at someone like Mitt Romney, everybody knows he changes his mind about lots of issues. I suppose what I would say to you about that is it can be a stick to beat you with, in the sense that if you never change your mind about anything, is that in itself healthy? Time and history helps change your views. I've, I've changed and modified my views on, uh, on, on what I think about the, uh, the death penalty. Mm -hmm. So it's not overly rigid, but I, I see it as refinement and growth in developing a philosophy that uh, is a defense of liberty. Liberty, the concept of liberty has been around for, you know, bits and pieces for thousands of years. And of course, we've had a grand experiment here and uh, I'm motivated by the fact that I'd hate to see it lost, and I'd like to refine it, uh, pick up the pieces where we left off a while ago, and actually improve upon what we had in the past. Now you are the, the oldest candidate, and you have been, even when there were nine candidates, and yet the one that many say has the most energy, and you have the biggest youth following. What do you put this down to? A, where do you get all this energy from? <laughs> well... You, you know, I don't know exactly, uh, you know, where does our health come from? There's a lot of things. Mental health is important. Do you Physical. work out? Do you have a regime on the campaign? Yes, and it gets interrupted sometime in the campaign. <laughs> I can't quite do it, but hi historically, you know, for 30 or 40 years, as long as I can remember, I've had a pretty strict regime, and, and it involves uh, a lot of exercise, and it uh, also eating habits are, are very important. So what do you do exercise-wise? If when you have time. Okay, when I have time, I would get up in the morning and I want to get outside. I'm sort of, outside gives me relaxation, so I, I don't want to ride an exercise cycle inside. I ride a bike mm -hmm. uh, and I walk, but in the morning I like to walk between three and four miles. It takes me about an hour or so to do that, and that sort of clears my head mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, loosens me up. And good health habits, I think, 
can prevent a, a usage of a lot of medication. So I strive for that, and unfortunately, but I think my parents might have had a little bit to do with good health. Good they genes, lived at yeah. old, old age. So what about diet? What do you do for eating and drinking? Do you have any strict regime with that? Not not overly strict. I'm not fanatic, but I I do watch the white things, the white sugars, and all and. Uh, Although I do eat meat, I think fish is better. So, but it's not not overly radical, you know. But I think fresh vegetables are good. So, most of it is probably more common sense than anything I learned in medical well, school. Look, you look good on it. Is this part of the reason you think that the youth are energized by you? They look upon you as a great role model, but also they like the fact that you are this guy who sticks to his principles. Oh, I think that is it, and uh, I think sometimes then they will translate that in, well, he sticks to his principles about health habits, but no, I think it's the principles of liberty that are so inviting to young people. I think their minds are more open. Uh, I don't think their minds have been cluttered. I don't think they've been forced to uh, accept things and accept the status quo. And besides, we live in an era today where the failure of government programs is so blatant. And uh, although I've been doing this for a long time, and we have had a lot of interest in the last five to ten years, it really came to life once the uh, financial crisis, which many of us who have been involved in Austrian economics predicted would come, and it sort of confirmed it, and people are very uneasy about the future, whether it's here or in Europe, and of course we're all interconnected now with global uh, trade and global banking. So I think that has, uh, you know, energized the people because I've been talking differently and warning about these things. And Does it I, help also that you were a child of the Great Depression? You know, you grew up through that depression. You, you came out the other end and you saw what it took, I think, to do that. I was fascinated to read the sheer volume of jobs that you did <laughs> when you were a young man. I mean, you did all sorts of stuff. You worked with your father on the dairy, but you did countless jobs. You worked very, very hard. Do you see that kind of hard work ethic now in America? And is, if the answer is no, is that one of the fundamental problems, that that work ethic has evolved oh, I, over the years? Yeah, I think uh, uh, that's a big issue. And people ask me about how my parents might have had influence on politics. Well, they were conservative Republicans, but they were more Republicans than anything else. But I think where they contributed a lot to my thinking was it was a work ethic, depression in World War II. Matter of fact, the depression didn't end until after World War II because I remember World War II better than the Depression, and actually things got worse because it was rationing and there were no new cars and all. So the work ethic was very, very important. And uh, I, I think uh, that had a, a large impact on me. Uh, at the same time, I worked that into a philosophy. Uh, but I think, and I talk a lot about it at my speeches, you know, especially on the college campuses, of not depending on the government. They're not there. They're bankrupt. They try to give everybody a free house. And now they don't have jobs and they don't have their houses. So therefore, you have to assume responsibility for yourself. But how far do you take that? Because although I agree with you to a certain degree, I think I take issue when it comes to something like health care, where you have quite provocative views here. I mean, your belief basically is that if you can't afford the insurance for Medicare or whatever it may be, then you've got to fend for yourself somehow or get your local community to bail you out. Am I misrepresenting you? Or is that basically how you feel? Yeah, but it's a lot more compassionate than the way, you know, it might is, sound. Is it, is it, though? Yeah, well, really, because uh, if you see the extent of uh, total socialism, it's not very compassionate. People end up with no care at all. I mean, uh, what happened at the end of the Soviet system? Everybody had free care, but there was no Soviet system. They were totally bankrupt because they had an empire that failed. And, and today, nobody's... We've had... I was in medicine when we had no government, and I don't remember the problems as badly as I remember the problems now. But what about, what about the, as we have in Britain, the basic right to health care for every citizen? What is wrong with that as a, a principle, an ambition to aspire to? Well, I think the basic uh, principle is wrong in that you don't have a right to somebody else's life or money. Uh, you have a right to your life, and you have a right to your liberty, and you have a right to keep what you earn, but you don't have a right to take food from somebody else, and you say, well, I'm not going to take it. The government's going to take the food. You don't have a right to somebody else's house. Oh, yes, but the government will get the house for me. So we who believe in the freedom philosophy believe that you can't use violence to get what you want, but you can't use the government to use violence and force. But, but what if you don't have the ability to actually get your own health care? You have no means to do that. What do the people who Mitt Romney was dismissive of the other day, and we'll come to that, what do those people do? Absolutely the most vulnerable 
parts of society. What do they do? Well, it, under your presidency, what would they do to get health care? Well, you have to understand the difference between an, an interventionist economy and a socialist economy. Uh, if you really want to produce the best medical care and the, and the best prosperity, the largest middle class, you have to do it through freedom. If you do it through redistribution of wealth, you actually reduce the availability. Let's take a little break. I want to come back and talk to you more about the economy, also about how you keep America great through tough times like this, and what you think of today's jobless figures, which, whichever way you look at it, are pretty good news for Barack Obama. Sorry, politicians. Lots of bark. When it's showtime, whimpering like little shih tzus. You want big cuts. Ron Paul's been screaming it for years. Budget crisis, no problem. Got a trillion bucks year one. That's trillion with a T. Department of Education, gone. Interior, energy, HUD, commerce, gone. Later, bureaucrats. Recent campaign ad from Ron Paul. It's interesting, this, because I follow what you say about how you get out of tough times. And it's probably completely opposite to how Barack Obama's doing it. And yet today, we saw jobless figures, which are the best since he became president. Do you give him credit for that? Do you think he's doing a good job in reducing the job, jobless figures? Or how would you summarize your feelings? I, I wouldn't give him too much credit. Of course, everybody should be pleased that there are more jobs now than there were a month ago. But they're pre pretty puny to what we should be doing. But if you look at those figures and dissect them out, they're not all that glamorous. Because uh, during that uh, last month, 1.2 million people dropped out of the workforce. So if you get 200,000 new jobs and 1.2 dropped out, you still lost a million jobs. So if you take that into consideration, you can't turn these people into non-people. You can't fudge the figures. And that's what politicians do. I understand. Wait, let, let me, let me yeah. try to finish that. If, if you do that, actually, the unemployment rate is 11%, not 8.5. It went up it, rather than gone down, if um, you count Isn't people. there a problem here, though, that if all the Republicans keep dumping on what are apparently good figures, then the momentum, the positivity that America needs to get itself out of recession gets stymied a bit. I mean, I'm, I'm going to read you a quote here, which I thought was classic. Well, can I answer that? Well, well, let me just read you this quote. <laughs> this is from uh, Jeb Hensarling, who's a, who's a Republican representative. He said, today is an indication of another failure of his president's policies. 36 months in a row of 8% plus unemployment, which is a ludicrous way of spinning it. How can you say this is another example of a president getting things wrong well, the, on a day when actually the official figures, whichever way you dress them up, are positive? Isn't the better thing, the more, I, I suppose, the more credible position for Republicans okay, to say, to say to, I am encouraged by this, but he should have gone further? To me, it's more, more important that you admit the truth. So if I'm speaking the truth, so we might have to compare mm -hmm. figures and all. But let's assume for a second that I'm speaking the truth and the, the uh, 200,000 new jobs was a net benefit. But what I'm saying is we quit counting people. We disavowed them. So if I'm speaking the truth, the most important thing is we know the truth, not, not at all. Matter of fact, uh, you'll probably have me a hard time. You probably haven't heard me in a speech. I do talk about the president a little bit, mainly on attack on civil liberties and maybe not doing enough about the wars. So I'm not in that same people that say, well, the president didn't do enough. It's all the president's fault. Because it isn't. Uh, he hasn't done anything to come, come in my direction of going back to a market economy or looking at the balancing budget. Nobody, Republicans or Democrats, don't want to cut anything. What, so, about, what about Mitt Romney's comment about he's not concerned about the poor? Let's just, just play this, and then I'll get your reaction. I'm in this race because I care about Americans. I, I'm not concerned about the very poor. We have a safety net there. If it needs a repair, I'll fix it. It was a misstatement. I misspoke. Uh, I've said something that, that is similar to that, but quite acceptable for a long time. And you know when you do, I don't know how many thousands of interviews, now and then you may get it wrong. And I misspoke. I mean, he says now is a misstatement, but he didn't say that immediately. And it, it just sounded awful, that, didn't it? For somebody aiming to be president to talk about the poor in that way yeah. seemed callous at best. The, the way I saw it, this out, I don't have probably any agreements with Mitt on, on policies, mm -hmm. foreign policy, monetary policy, spending policy, bailout policy. But, you know, I think, I think it was a big issue because of politics, because of the opposition, the demagoguing, the media jumping on this. And actually, I, I think I ended up probably defending him more than he defended himself. Because I don't believe for a minute 
that if Mitt Romney was sitting here, that if he released everything in his heart, he says, you know what? The truth is, I really don't care about poor people. No, but what, about, that isn't, I, no, no, so but I don't what believe he did that. Say, but what he did say unequivocally is that they wouldn't be a priority. And I found that extraordinary. If I was president, which I'll never be because I'm British, the poor would be my absolute priority. Okay. Would they be yours? If that is your number one priority, if you listen to what I've been talking about and understood free market economics, you would say the most important thing you do, can do is give them a sound currency, limited government, free markets, contract rights, don't bail out anybody, no privileged classes, and that's when the poor would get the benefits, that's when the jobs would come. But this whole fallacy of saying that we have to, see, I'm concerned about the poor more than anybody or as much as anybody, but I don't think robbing one group and giving more money to the poor and saying, well, you can have your house, just pay the bills, but he can't do it. So it's a failed policy. Yeah, but when you have it's good even, intention, but yeah, the good when, intentions don't yeah, solve our problem. When you have someone like Warren Buffett, one of the richest, most successful men in history, begging to be taxed more, publicly saying, tax me, tax me, give the money to those who don't have and, it. And in, uh, what is wrong with that? And, well, let them pay. Remember going around, there was yeah, a... What is wrong with having a tax system which just taxes well, people it, like him more? Well, it, it, it destroys the economy if you just... Yes, it doesn't. And well, actually, let him pay. Does he, actually, does there he is, pay? Why doesn't he send more money to the yeah, Treasury? There is little evidence that raising taxation for the very rich ever destroys an economy. It doesn't. Well, that, that I disagree Historically, with. Historically, it hasn't. That, that I disagree with because government, what are they, they going to do with the money? Are they going to uh, subsidize the housing industry again and have that thing blow up? Are they going to start another war? That's why they need the money. Yeah, the problem with the housing industry wasn't that the that poor people got housing. It was that greedy bankers and financial institutions brought in the subprime mortgage scams right. which preyed on people who didn't understand the system. But That's I mean, what happened. But where would the speculation come from if you didn't have easy credit? Where did the money come from? Well, if, it had, if it had come from savings, yeah. they wouldn't I, have done it. I agree with personal responsibility. A lot right. of the middle classes that people are rushing to support, I think, overmax their credit cards, spent money they didn't okay. have, right. and, and, and are trying to absolve themselves, in many cases, right. from personal responsibility. But I come back to this. When Mitt Romney said what he said about, I'm not concerned with the poor, I really felt offended for everybody in America. I was like, you've got to have a president. Uh, I, I, you, I think you've you, got to have a president who prioritizes the poor, haven't you? Okay. Now, if I'd have been confronted with that, the answer would have been different. But the, the would answer would have been different than your answer. You would want more government and more spending. I would have said, that is my deep concern. If you are a true humanitarian, if you care about the poor people, and if you care about not shrinking the middle class, like it's going on right now, we're getting more poor in the shrinking of the middle class, you cannot do it without looking at the monetary policy. If you don't do anything else, exclude everything else, but you just depreciate the currency, the middle class gets wiped out. If you're on the receiving end, the banks and the corporations, the military industrial complex, they get tremendous benefit. The wealth is automatically transferred from the middle class. The poor get poorer and the wealthy get wealthier. And then when the bailouts come, they even benefit more and the bad debt, which should have been liquidated, is dumped on the people. The flip side to the bailout argument is that when you look at the car industry, Barack Obama did bail out the car industry and now they're doing very well. So bailouts can work. Indisputably. Well, you're, you're making an assumption it wouldn't have worked with uh, honest bailouts. It's not an honest bailout. Well, you don't know. It's chicken and the egg, isn't it? But the no, point no, no, is... No, no, it isn't. If you'd had an honest bailout, the people who own those bonds would have been protected. But he turned the ownership over to the unions. So that is not fair. He, so used, he, he used force was he to wrong? transfer... He, he was wrong to break the contracts. Governments are there to enforce contracts, not to adjust the contracts for the benefit of their political constituency. Even if it works? Oh, especially if it works. I mean, if a criminal robs a bank and it works, <laughs> you, you, don't, you don't justify the robbing of the bank. Let's take a break. Come back and talk foreign policy and specifically the threat of war with Iran. Now, my special guest, Ron Paul, let me ask you this. Uh, you've lived through many American military conflicts in your lifetime, uh, since the early part of last century. How many of them do you believe were justified? 
Well, justified plus legal. Yeah. Well, I think people, people assume you're a pacifist. Yeah, I, I don't get the feeling you are a pacifist. No, I'm not a pacifist. I think you, you believe in military action where it is legitimate. But how right. many do you think of the major conflicts have been legitimate? Well, from a strict constitutional viewpoint, I don't want to fight any wars that aren't declared. So that means since World War II, nothing has been justified because we didn't go through the proper process. But when you look back... Did you support the conflict in Afghanistan? I did, but that said to go after only those individuals responsible for 9-11, not to go into nation building, not going in, you know, into Iraq. But it was war, wasn't it? Uh, to go after al-Qaeda was going like going after criminals. As a matter of fact, at the time, what I did was... Was it constitutional? Well, uh, to, yes, to a degree, because it was limited. But what I introduced was a resolution to clarify this. Don't turn it into an excuse to go into country and occupy countries and take over countries and go into nation building. I said, look to our history about the letter of mark and reprisal. When you're attacked, say, at Pearl Harbor mm. and declared war, that's certainly legitimate. It, we, even though we had a declaration of war in World War I, it was a, it was a constitutional war, but it was a very foolish what is, adventure. What is the ideological difference between being attacked in Pearl Harbor and being attacked at the World Trade Center? I mean, if you are but under... A, but a country didn't attack... Uh, I mean, a bunch of thugs attacked us, uh, not a country. So there's a big difference. It's... Uh, it's, uh, there were probably, a, the people, I imagine and there weren't even 100 people that knew 9-11 was coming. Mm. Maybe there were 50, maybe there were 40 for all we know. So it was a, a band of thugs that had a grievance with us and they were trying to get our attention. So that's entirely different than... Uh, Have you modified your opinion of what the motivation was? And the reason I ask, you got a lot of flack at the time, although a lot of support as well, for suggesting that the main motivation for the attacks was revenge for what had been going on in Iraq and I'm sure a lot of it was but you also said that you didn't believe it was an anti-west sentiment an anti-riches an anti-capitalism I'm not sure that's true is it I mean it's it certainly if you were to interview the 9-11 attackers I'm pretty damn sure they would also say we are against western values we are against capitalism and so on well, wouldn't, I wouldn't don't they? there's no evidence to that if you read Robert Pape and Michael Schur you'll find out they're pretty much the experts on the subject and that's not uh, not their conclusion but if you look at the 9-11 Commission if you look at the DOD studies if you look at the CIA even if you look at what Paul Wolfowitz has said you know the the, the great uh, yeah, yeah. neocon uh, they've come to the conclusion that our presence in the Middle East was the most significant event on why they wanted to come here and kill us and let's assume you become President Ron Paul if Iran was to strike back at Israel uh -huh. what would you do well, I go and, and look to the rules, and the rules are that if our national security is threatened, you uh, explain it to the people, and then you go to the Congress and say, is our national security threatened to such a degree that we declare war against a particular country? If you believed that Iran had enough enriched uranium to genuinely launch a nuclear attack against Israel, would that knowledge alone mean that you would countenance military well, action? One thing that we should set aside is there's uh, our CIA and the Mossad, uh, Israel are not arguing that they have the case, and even, even Israel said, the, the leader of the Mossad said, even if they had a weapon, it's not an existential threat to them. So you and, wouldn't ever countenance any preemptive strike? No, not really. Never? Why, why, sh why should we? That's aggression. Uh, uh, we, we're not supposed to commit aggression. I mean, that's left for the dictators. But, uh, you know, we're, we now don't do aggression, but we, what we do is preemptive war. But if you had got but knowledge... preemptive for... war is equivalent to that, and I think it's very dangerous. But they have already said, Ahmadinejad has made it quite clear, he believes in wiping out Israel, if he got uh -huh. the chance. Okay. If, I, if you were president in the, in the Second World War, and you'd been given knowledge the Japanese were planning Pearl Harbor, you would have preemptively struck, wouldn't you? Well, let, let me touch your first subject first, and that is uh, quoting Ahmadinejad, because that's a, that's a misquote, but 99% of the people in the media would misquote it, and everybody in Washington believes mm -hmm. it. Uh, what, what he actually said on the proper interpretation was that the regime in charge of Jerusalem uh, should be removed from the pages of time. He did not say that Israel should be wiped from the face of the earth. Just think of the difference on that, removing a regime like getting rid of our administration You're or something. You're not seriously defending Ahmadinejad, right? 
I'm, I'm trying to defend honesty, and I'm trying to defend openness and willing to, uh, willing to stop a war just Did to you see just, him as just, a friend. Please, please let me finish my sentence. Just like John Kennedy was able to talk to Khrushchev. If we can talk to Khrushchev and he had 30,000 missiles, why can't we talk to a country that doesn't have a nuclear missile? And they are not, but according to the record, they're not on the, the verge of I'm it either. on this is a lot of Americans who, you know, may like, they may like you personally or whatever, but they think you're weak on this because of the preemptive issue. And I come back to that question I put to you. If you had knowledge and you were president when Pearl Harbor happened, if you had pre-knowledge of that happening, would you have attacked Yeah, an, Japan? Em, an imminent attack. We're seeing, we're seeing the planes come over, obviously, yes. An imminent attack. Well, I mean intelligence. An imminent attack. Intelligence, it may happen. An imminent attack is quite different when the planes are coming versus this uh, fiction. Just, we shouldn't have such short memories. Everything they're saying about Iran, we said about Iraq, and they were all lies. And how many men died? 8,500 Americans died. 44,000 no, come totally back crippled. I totally agree with you about so, Iraq. Well, I, but it's the same principle. I, as a newspaper editor, it, it as a newspaper editor back in Britain, I opposed the war in Iraq vigorously and loudly for then two years. Then you should oppose us going into Iran. I, I think Iran is a different situation. Why? Because I think that they would, if they could, consider attacking Israel. Well, I I, and if you're America. You can't let that happen. And the Israelis are looking to why America they, why for not, leadership, aren't they? Why shouldn't they depend on the British? Why doesn't the British take care of them? They used to have, they have a lot of influence over there. Let all the British kids go over there and die. I mean, why, why, why is it assumed that we are the policemen of the world, that it's our moral obligation? Besides, we're broke. But aren't there times when you have to be the policeman of the world? No. Really? It is not. We should provide for our national security. We, are, we do not have the authority. We do not have the money. And, and we, we don't have the moral authority to do this because it leads to trouble. Let's take a break. Come back and talk social issues. I want to talk to you about marriage, gay marriage, abortion. See what you really think. I think Ron Paul's views are totally outside the mainstream of virtually every uh, decent American. Newt Gingrich calling Ron Paul totally outside the mainstream. <laughs> this is a man who wants a, a moon colony, <laughs> Mr. Mainstream. Um, let's talk social issues, because people often say you are a conservative liberal, and there aren't many of those around, uh, Ron Paul. Let me ask you about your view of gay marriage, because I've read differing twists right. on this. Okay. What is your honest opinion about gay marriage? I, I am totally neutral on the cause of liberty. When people want to be married and call it a marriage, it's none of my business. I can set my standards, and then others can decide whether they want to follow me or not, but I would never use force You don't to do believe that. in abortion under any circumstances. It's something that's driven, I think, by your time as a doctor. You delivered many, many babies. And I read a heart-rending thing you once said, that you once delivered, I think, a two-and-a-half-pound baby. That you, as you said, you had to put into a bucket. Not me. I wasn't a participant. I was a very, very casual observer as a student. Of, but you witnessed this. Yeah, I walk in a room and it happened. It was five minutes. It was over. I walked out of the room and I thought, wow, what did I just see? But it clearly scarred it was, you It was about that it. lack of respect for life that it dawned on me. There was Here's no, the dilemma, and it's one I put to Rick Santorum very recently, and I was surprised by his answer although I sort of understood from his belief point of view that he would come up with this. But it's a dilemma that I'm going to put to you. You have two daughters. You have many granddaughters. If one of them was raped, and I, I accept it's a very unlikely thing to happen, but if they were, would you honestly look at them in the eye and say they had to have that child if they were impregnated? Now, if, if it's an honest rape, um, that individual should go immediately to the emergency room I would give them uh, a shot of estrogen. Or so give you, them... you would allow them to abort the baby? Yeah, well, th th it is absolutely in limbo because an hour after, after intercourse or a day afterwards, there is no legal or medical uh, you know, problem. If you talk about somebody coming in and they say, well, I was raped and I'm seven months pregnant and I don't want to have anything to do with it, it's a little bit different story, but somebody arriving in an emergency room say, I have just been raped, and uh, there's, there's no chemical, there's no medical, and there's no legal uh, so evidence of a pregnancy. So life doesn't begin at conception? Life does begin at conception, but... Uh, then you'd be taking a life. 
Well, you don't know if you're taking a life either because this is, this is an area that uh, is, but to, to decide everything about abortion and respect for life on this one very, very theoretical condition where there may have been a life or not a life. No, but here's the thing. Although it is a hypothetical, it does happen. People do get raped and they do get impregnated and sometimes they're so ashamed by what's happened yeah. that weeks go by before they may even discover they're pregnant. And they have to face this dilemma and they're going to have a president who has a very, very okay. strong view well, about this. Now this is like uh, the proposal that the people who like abortion endorse abortion uh, because it's a woman's right to her body. You say, well, does that mean one minute before birth you can kill the baby? And I did this on one of the TV programs mm -hmm. where some women were opposed to what I was saying. I said, this non-time baby, it's in the woman, she has the right, she argues with her case. I said, you would abort this baby because the woman has had some unfortunate circumstances, so the doctor gets paid a handsome fee to kill this nine-pound baby. Oh, that's not what we're talking about. But that is what they're talking about. They're talking about a human life. So a, a, a person immediately after rape, uh, yes, uh, it's a tough one, and uh, I won't satisfy everybody there. But to tell you the truth, what I saw happening in the 1960s and the change in the law and, uh, uh, no, the change in attitude and people were doing illegal abortions. To me, it's a moral problem. It was to change the morality of the 60s. The lack of respect for life mm. leads to the lack of respect for liberty and all the things that I believe in. So it was a change in morality that had the Supreme Court change the law. Mm. So I don't believe the change in the law is the magic cure. Uh, I, have, I do believe, though, very sincerely, if we don't have an understanding of life and have a lot of respect for life, I can't defend people on their personal liberties. I can't be as tolerant as I am on how they use their liberties. So that's why I think it's really a moral issue uh, rather than a legal solution uh, to all these problems. Then, as a physician, as a gynecologist, I've had to face some of these very, very difficult uh, problems, and I understand them. And even before Roe versus Wade, many of those problems that existed where there's no perfect answer, they were taken care of, but it was always done. They respected the fact that they were dealing with a life. But do you, and, and just finally on this point, do you accept there's a slight contradiction between a candidate who is pro-liberty, pro-personal choice, pro-personal responsibility in almost every other area, but on this specific area says no? You see, don't have choice. See, I don't see the inconsistency because I see the nine-pound baby that's still within the mother as deserving some protection, too, who deserves a protection. That fetus has rights because if I do harm to him, I get sued. If you have a car accident and kill okay. a fetus, there are legal rights there. But to say that it's only the mother, it's very, very unique. If you carry your argument to the all the way through, we have a right to our homes. Shouldn't we have the privacy of our homes? Do we have a right to kill the baby one minute after birth? No, no, very said. Matter of fact, this is what happens. We can kill the baby before it's born and the doctor gets paid. One minute after birth, if the woman who was unfortunate enough to have this baby, if she throws the baby away, she gets arrested for a homicide. Mm. And to me, the one minute before birth and one minute after birth isn't a whole lot different. So well, you understand uh, that to a lot of people with serious religious conviction it is I mean they say life begins at conception life does begin at conception so it's a moral maze let's have a break let's come back and talk about your family because you've got an incredible family you've got five children how many grandchildren 18 and how many great-grandchildren amazing let's come back and talk about your extraordinary family and your wife Pretty extensive uh, tour, and my wife's been with me. She didn't make it this morning because uh, uh, this was her day. I, uh, I said that she could sleep in, and I provided her breakfast for her this morning because it's our 55th wedding anniversary day. <laughs> Ron Paul, on how he and his wife Carol celebrated their 55th anniversary this week. Congratulations. Thank you. An amazing achievement. What's the secret to a long lasting marriage, do you think? I think a lot is respect and acceptance of both of our shortcomings and uh, I and I just think that um, 
if you if you have respect for other people and uh, reject the whole idea that you force people either intimidate or you know I don't like it in politics I don't like it in interpersonal relationship you do it my way or else I think people get into trouble when they try to force their way on others and certainly in a good marriage you shouldn't be using intimidation and force uh, to try to get along what I mean it must be say, a better way if Carol was here what would she say your shortcomings are Oh, she'd probably be pretty generous, you know, and, and not want to <laughs> talk do, what about. What do you think they are? What well, do you think? You're being self-critical. Well, I can I can get upset, and w most people don't realize that I do get upset. Unfortunately, she gets on the receiving end. Uh, you know, even if I get tired in the campaign, you know, if I complain about the campaign, I usually don't go to the campaign manager. <laughs> I complain <laughs> to her. <laughs> but I think that's been part of it. You know, if, if she has a problem, if she's not feeling well, or she has something, uh, she's allowed to come to me. So maybe part of that, uh, a good marriage is being a sounding board for the other person. What do you believe about discipline with children? Were you a spanker when you were young? No, not really, but I wasn't spanked, you know, when I was growing up and our kids didn't get spanked, there, there'd be a, a time, you know, you might have to give them a little tap or something, you know, to remind them. And do you believe them. parents should still have that right to give their kids a little tap? Oh yeah, as long as they're not, you know, practicing severe child abuse. No, it but, is. But, a sma but, a smack. but boy, I'll tell you, I would work real hard uh, to promote and an understanding that uh, you don't achieve a whole lot of, uh, you don't achieve a whole lot by using force and intimidation. Just like in politics, you know, I reject the use of force, telling other countries what to do and what to do with your personal behavior and all. So raising kids would be the same way. Uh, I can remember growing up, and we had certain real strong belief. Then I thought back, I wonder when my parents ever talked to me about behavior, or drinking, or anything. They never did. It was sort of through osmosis that that you know what the standards are. And uh, fortunately, we've had five wonderful children, and I think uh, there must have been a little bit of osmosis there because <laughs> I certainly wasn't a lecturer <laughs> on exactly what they had what to do. The, what were the most important values your parents instilled in you, do you think? We discussed hard work, but what else? I think it's a hard work. They had a lot of respect for religious values. I mean, we, we did go to church routinely. I was raised in a Lutheran church, and uh, confirmation in the church was a major event. Uh, when, when we were old enough to decide we wanted to be confirmed in the church, that became a bigger event than any birthday party or any other kind of celebration. That was, that was pretty important. I want to end with two things that's happened this week. One's about to happen, one's already happened, which in many ways sum up the very best of America. In my view, one is the, the Facebook uh, situation where you have a young kid who has a brilliant idea and it turns into a hundred million dollar <laughs> idea and he creates a thousand millionaires. Is that a good thing? I mean, when you look at that, do you see any negatives or do you think that is what the American dream at its purest is about? I, I think it is and I think you picked a good example, even though I don't know all the details, because he provided a service and he didn't make money as much as he knew something that he anticipated people might like. Uh, he became wealthy because he gave a service. The consumer voted him to have this confidence. Now, there are many in society today, and so I'm sort of on the side of uh, Wall, uh, Occupy Wall Street when they complain about the 1%, mm -hmm. but I separate the two. If you made your money because you provided a service and the people bought it, and they didn't get subsidies from the government mm -hmm. or benefits, say, from an inflationary system, and they didn't get bailouts and all these things, that to me is entirely different. Giants or Patriots? I'm Giants or Patriots? Super Bowl? Super Bowl. I haven't paid much attention to it. <laughs> I've been paying attention to Nevada and a few other primaries. Now, let's talk Nevada very briefly at the end. You're trailing in the polls at the moment. How confident are you of a good performance in Nevada? How important is it you perform well in Nevada? I think it's very important, but I think I don't think it's the end of anything. Uh, and I think we are going to do well. And it, each primary, uh, we've we've done much much better than we did four years ago. So that is one thing to compare it to. And uh, we're down to uh, uh, you know four candidates right now, and we have a good organization in Nevada. Will uh, you I, ever drop out of this race, or are you here to the to the bitter end? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll drop out if somebody gets inaugurated next <laughs> next but, January. But nothing will stop you before.
before the convention. Uh, I'm not thinking in those terms because I'm thinking in campaigning uh, where the next stop is, where do I go this evening, and where do I sleep tonight, and how I'm going to encourage all the workers to get the vote out. Hypothetically, if you got to a point where you did want to drop out, could you imagine endorsing another candidate? Would you do that, or are you implacably opposed to doing that just on principle? Well, it, it would be a, a real challenge, um, but I think people change their minds. Some of them change their minds <laughs> more easily than others. So if they change them favorably and they can convince me, my, I, I would certainly be open to that. Ron Paul, best of luck at the voter and the rest of the campaign. Thank you. You certainly brought a lot of energy, drive, and I can tell you one thing, we will get more reaction on Twitter and Facebook to this interview than any interview I've done with any other candidate. That's that is a given. One for four. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> That's Ron Paul. When we come back, a supersized only in America.